Travelling from Cairns to Normanton, in the heart of Northern Australia's Gulf Country, is a flight of pure nostalgia, with perhaps a touch of the sublime to ridiculous. The old Warhorse DC-3, Air Queensland's Flight 140, to the Golflander, Queensland Railway's once a week service between the towns of Normanton and Croydon, a link by one relic of the past to another. Both are among the great survivors in Australian transport history. Air Queensland is the only airline in Australia still using DC-3s on scheduled flights. They fit the region now as snugly as they did during the war years, when they were an even more vital link, when it was soldiers vying for cabin space with the cargo. It can be no frills travel through the Gulf Country, but Air Queensland do it in a manner the locals understand, even to handing out boiled lollies before landing. Once only the most ardent travellers passed through Normanton Station, now this National Trust classified railway has become a showpiece and a must for tourists. Officially, the train is known as the Golflander. Whatever it's called, this is one of the world's most unusual railways between two of the most remote towns in Australia. There have been a lot of Normantons and Croydons in Australia's railway past, but only one Golflander. On the other side of Australia, in the southwest, the Australand, a narrow gauge train of the same era, is also the last of a line. And in the Dandenong Ranges outside Melbourne, the famous Puffing Billy still flies the banner for its unique ultra-narrow gauge steam travel. But nowhere else could there exist another station like Normanton Railway Station. And it would be nearly impossible to find another station master, ticket seller, train driver, chief mechanic and general fix-it man in the mould of Charlie Honey. He and his assistant Paddy are the sum total of staff on this line. And that's the way Charlie likes it. It's a railway which runs according to the gospel of Charlie Honey. And if you're a tourist, you like it or lump it. I can get pretty irked at times. And I get a reputation for being abrupt at times. You bend the out explaining things to people, and then all of a sudden they say, oh, can you do this or can you do that? And why don't the train run to Bertia? Why don't it run to Cromwell? After nearly 50 years in the railways, Charlie's ready to retire, so tourists won't be a problem much longer. In the meantime, Paddy has a career decision to make, whether to step into Charlie's shoes or make way for another trainee. Well, that was not like the last bloke I trained. What happened to the last bloke you trained? Well, I better not tell you. <laughs> he had a feeling for the coloured race. And? A female section. And got the better of it. His nerves cracked. <laughs> it's hard to imagine any frayed nerves at Normanton. The pace is so slow that no one's bothered to move old rail motor 60 
which went out of service 20 years ago. She was one of a series of rail motors known as the Tin Hares. Time has been witness to only the most minor changes at Normanton Railway Station. For example, Charlie's always been going to fix RM60, but like a good many things up here, she's waiting. Yeah, we'll get done up one of these days and somebody get a bit of day to play around with. You're not going to do it? No. Oh, I thought you wanted to. No, not now. Oh, lost the enthusiasm? Yep. How come? Took the van, we've got in, started smashing too much of it and too much stuff got pinched off it. What was its history? Where'd she come from? Well, old Cairns would have been the last coastal one of them. They was the ones that used to go to Cooktown. They used to go from Cairns and they used to change the buggies over at Cooktown because there was now a gauge up there. She doesn't uh, have any nostalgic value anymore for you? Hey, I think you do. <laughs> I mean, that, your, those, fa those cigarettes of yours are famous. I thought you would have uh, got that right first, Gary. Um, well, what I was saying is merely a slip between a cup and a lip. <laughs> it's a even been there? said that the Golflander runs on log cabin fine cut. And it's no wonder. There's hardly a waking moment that Charlie isn't smoking. It's not surprising he feels the same towards old fine-cut cans as he does towards the old rail motors. They tend to be left lying around waiting for Charlie to give them a new lease of life. Charlie has been well brought up in the traditions of Queensland rail. And while it's the bane of his life and the cross he has to bear, he knows to put paperwork before almost anything else, even paying customers. Excuse me, could I buy tickets for the train tomorrow, please? In the morning, love. Right, thank you. Too much with you. Buy a ticket now and decide you don't want to go and I've got to cancel out and I've got to do all that paperwork to get rid of it. All so right. it's better if you buy it in the morning. In the morning then. Okay. okay. From a normally lazy outback metropolis, the crescendo of Normanton builds on the day before the trip to Croydon. Charlie, you seem to have a lot of carbon paper there. Yep, need it too. Why is that? You're going to get very brittle up here with the heat. You like the paperwork much? Nope. Would it be the worst part of the job, maybe? No, yeah. Treat it as you should treat it and not let it bog you down and you ride it rain. But once you let it bog you down, you're finished. This is a town for which the main reason to exist is the railway, while the railway exists only because of Normanton and Croydon. While Normanton Station is the town's most famous feature, it also boasts an assortment of hotels, best described as unique. It's also headquarters of the Carpentaria Shire and was named after the leader of an expedition to find explorers Burke and Wills. It was a thriving centre early this century and even gave birth to the shipping company Burns Filt. The company's original building still stands as a monument to the free enterprise origins of the Gulf Country. The Burnsville port was on the Norman River, with a branch line back to the station. The remains of most locos, carriages and trucks used on the line since it opened in 1891 can be found around the Normanton station or along the track to Croydon. The official reason is that when successive locomotives and rolling stock became obsolete, the isolation of Normanton and the station 
made it too expensive to move them far, so they were simply dumped. Wednesday mornings are a ritual for Charlie and Paddy, and not even a busload of tourists arriving later will deter them from their appointed tasks. How big's the kid? Oh, he's only five. 
There's never any rush or panic at Normanton Station, but Leaping Lena, as the locals have dubbed her, always leaves on time. That's also according to Honey's Law. Five rail motors have worked the Normanton Croydon line before this one. In fact, by the line's standards, rail motor number 93 is a youngster, one of the new breed, built in 1950. It's been an inspection car in other parts of Queensland, but came to Normanton in 1982 to replace RM70. The trailer car is even younger, 32 years old, and hails from New South Wales. It's very much a bus on rails with a 102 horsepower diesel motor and four-speed gearbox. The can of log cabin will empty when the rail motor does at Croydon. Charlie reckons the Golflander does roughly 150 kilometres to the can, or a 10 each way. The scheduled time for the trip from Normanton to Croydon is 8.30am to 1.30pm. With stops along the way, they should average about 20 kilometres every hour. Didn't you do it once in about two hours ten, though? What would, what would it be like when you go that much faster? Well, if you've got no passenger on your own and it's an outside trip, you're returning home, no problem. And if you've got a full load? And you keep the regulation speed. You really re how what's the fastest you could go on this track? Well, with a bit more work on it, you can sit comfortably on uh, 80 k's all the way over. And now? And now in the state that it's in? Now you'd be Oh, uh, I got 40 k's a big maximum. Publicity over the last few years has made the Golflander a tourist favourite, but rarely for the whole trip. Coach captains wait for their charges 15 minutes out of Normanton and then beat the train to Croydon anyway. You're only on at 15 minutes, what do you think? Oh, I think it was bitter. It's got to be compulsory training for anybody to complain. 
Complaints about what? The railways. <laughs> Rather rough, but quite the experience. Oh, I don't think it'll pass the regulations down in the in the lower country. It's too fancy. Well, you got to keep in mind all the buckles, holes, pinks, any loose fish plates, zip joints. Hit them at the wrong speed, you'll do your springs in straight away. Not made to take a sudden jar. I would have thought you'd already done your springs in from the feel of it. <laughs> What's it do to the old build? Does it knock her about a bit and mean you've got to do a lot more repairs? Yep. You get careless, the more damage you do to it, the more work you've got to do. As the timber gets old and everything starts to fall apart on it, you've got to try and patch it up the best way you can. The material's pretty limited at all, it? It's scratching all the time. Charlie? We're working on it all the time. The track is both a fettler's dream and nightmare. Only one train a week to worry about, which means they can take their time. But along with that, there's the problem of knowing just where to start. Their biggest job is cutting back the grass. Certainly not too many rails or sleepers get replaced. The paradox of the Golflander is that people expect to be able to joke about it and they expect anything associated with it to be layback, but they do expect it. Hi, right, kids. How are you? How are you doing? Very good, thanks. Well, hang on to the change and I'll get back to you later. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah, I get to make sense changing that plastic glass. Look at that. Okay. Bring it out next week. Okay. Under normal conditions, delivering a load of hay may seem matter of fact. But when this whole area floods, and Leaping Lena is the only transport which can get through. It stops being a joke and becomes a necessity. It's during the wet season that the locals come back to the train and business booms. They expect Charlie to be there on Wednesday mornings and he doesn't let them down. Hey, Ferris, your spare wheel. There's only one road crossing in the trip, and that's at a place called Black Bull. It's an important stop for Charlie. Every time he comes in here, little Christy and her mum meet him. This cuddle has become another part of the honey folklore. Black Bull is also notable because it's the only stop along the track 
with buildings intact, including a corrugated iron structure, reputedly a refreshment room. No one's opened it to check, so these days it's strictly BYO. And passenger amenities are limited. One can only imagine the social scene here nearly a hundred years ago when A10 and B13 class locomotives ruled the line. The oldest loco used on the track was a B12 class, built in 1875 and taken to pull the Golf Lander in 1901. Leaping Lena begs comparisons, but there are none. Perhaps the hardest thing to come to grips with is that it's the official Queensland Government Railway's weekly service between Normanton and Croydon. That there is no reason to go to Croydon from Normanton, least of all in the Tin Hare, seems of minor concern. Arrival is an anticlimax because one, Croydon is even less a centre of population explosion than Normanton, and two, because Charlie doesn't let his passengers off until the second time around. That's after he spent at least five minutes negotiating what is known in railways parlance as a triangle. It's Charlie's proud boast that he can do all the manoeuvring without having to change points. He and Paddy have worked it so that neither of them need to get out in the searing heat. The rails are set in a triangular fashion so that Charlie can take the train in forward, reverse, go forward then reverse again, thus turning it to face back to Normanton, ready for tomorrow's return journey. Maybe it's because it's all over and Charlie feels free to fraternise. Maybe it's another part of the honey gospel. But before the remaining passengers are allowed to disperse, Charlie holds court. It's the first time he's said more than a few words to any of them. Well, folks, in the morning, 8.30 sharp on the way back to Norman. All right. Thanks, Charlie. See you then. Right. Good. Good. Good trip. What time See you then. Oh, any time after 8 o'clock. Is it a bit smoother going back? Mm. Is it a bit smoother? Oh, yeah, down old going oh, back. Good. You don't feel them so yeah. hard. <laughs> Normally, the end of the line in Croydon means nothing to do but drink and inspect the Gold Rush relics from a time when the Croydon Hall was a gathering place for the whole district. The hall is a grand monument to the era when Croydon meant gold. The heyday was 70 years ago. There were 50 pubs here then, one now. It's one of the towns on the rails around Australia which fits comfortably into a wild west mould. It was just over a year ago that they decided it was time for a new butcher shop. Even more than Normanton, Croydon's heart is still in the early part of this century. Charlie's group of tourists got a bonus. For the first time in 16 years, Croydon was celebrating a wedding. The club hotel was even more a focal point than normal 
when the locals gathered to be a rare piece of Croydon's recent history. groom was from Mount Isa and the bride from Croydon but they'll move away from Croydon to live part of a slow trend which will most likely put another nail in the Golflanders coffin although it could take a while it's unlikely there'll be a replacement for RM 93 her marriage with the Normanton Croydon line is decidedly shaky and if the divorce comes through before Charlie retires you can bet he'll find some last-minute paperwork to go with the annulment. <sighs> the Golflander will now be reviewed every 12 months by the Queensland Government Railways to determine whether or not it continues. There'll be no such considerations for the Australand, which runs from Perth to Bunbury in Western Australia, about as far away from the Gulf country of Queensland as it's possible to get in Australia. The Australand is a classic train of the 40s, incongruously blended with the 80s. It desperately needs to be complemented by an old loco steaming its way south on the 185 kilometre journey between two of the earliest settled areas of the West. But it appears nostalgia doesn't sit comfortably in West Wales plans. Over here, trains like this are seen as liabilities, which must soon make way for modern rail cars. Consequently, the Australand has had to weather the daily return trip with little or no attempts at repairs to its old frame. Timbers, eh? With names along the track like Manjumup, Wokalup, Pinjara, Waruna and Wajara, it sounds more like the route of an outback train. Yet the narrow gauge track passes through some of the most lush beef, dairy and pasture land in Australia, as well as bypassing the famous Jarrah timber belt of the west. Have your ticket, please. And you can go back to the land of Nod then. Even in its prime, the Australand wouldn't have been regarded as an imposing train. So the fact that it's the last of an era on the rails around Australia will probably pass unnoticed to all but the purists. The Australand got its name as a tribute to the early pioneers who developed the southwest and the town of Australand. Australand, a combination of the words Australia and India, was to be the centre of trade between those two countries. The name Australand won't sit as comfortably on a rail car as it did with these old carriages, which ironically will probably end their days sitting happily behind a steam engine, 
like those at Hotham Valley Tourist Railway on the Australind's route south to Bunbury. Until the final years of operation in the 60s, it was an important part of the West Australian Government Railway's steam system. Old locos still rest here, but not only as museum exhibits and memories of past glories. The W-class mountain type locos have been painstakingly restored. They're nurtured in the sheds of the old depot between their Sunday job of hauling tourists up into the nearby mountains. The line was established in the early part of this century to carry timber down those same mountains. The Hotham Valley operation is similar to Australia's most successful tourist railway, the Puffing Billy, in Melbourne's Dandenong Ranges. The Puffing Billy is also the last of a line, although there was a time in about 1900 when it was thought these little tank locos could be the economic answer to attracting settlers and servicing the more inaccessible hilly regions of Victoria. Now it's firmly entrenched as the fourth largest tourist attraction in Australia but is looking to build on its reputation by running more sophisticated trips during the daylight saving period. Champagne on the way up the hills, dinner during the stopover and perhaps a few ports on the way down. Puffing Billy was given a two foot six inch gauge so it could handle tight mountainous herbs. But it also helped to develop a think I can, I know I can personality. And now it's something of an institution on the rails around Australia. The Puffing Billy locomotives were never meant to pull hard-working tourist trains. Their life was intended to be based around weekly services pulling mixed passenger and goods trains, loaded with things like timber and potatoes. And of course the four locos which now work in rotation as Puffing Billy are last century's technology. So it's not surprising that for every six hours on the track, they spend at least one in the workshop. Ultimately, there'll come a time when the locos will look original, but be facsimiles, a combination of replacement and new parts. For the locos which end up in this workshop, there's only good news and bad news. This US-built Climax is a geared locomotive and runs on firewood. That makes it a real collector's item. So despite a rather inglorious working life hauling timber and breaking axles in eastern Victoria, it will be restored. Loco 6A, like the other puffing billies, was built in Melbourne and puffed long and hard through the hills. Yet it will be a source of spare parts and this frame will become a refurbished 12A, eventually taking over from 6A as a puffing billy. How often do you have to do something like this now? Oh, this is a major overhaul. We do it approximately every five years. These parts are all getting fairly worn at the moment. We've got a new recondition set to replace it with. Joe, would you assist me here, please? Thanks, mate. So how long could a, a train like uh, 14A, the engine 14A, keep going? We hope forever. Um, we're restoring and replacing parts all the time, and um, uh, we're getting the engines in a better and better condition as we go on. Neil Matheson and his co-workers at the Puffing Billy workshop are part of a rare and incongruous group, professional steam engine mechanics of the 1980s. Not only are they perpetuating a job which was much the same a hundred years ago, they're consolidating its place in the future. Puffing Billy now relies on full-time staff like Neil, when only 30 years ago the expense of running a regular train service on this track couldn't be justified. It was then that a fledgling group called the Puffing Billy Steam Preservation Society came to its rescue, starting with a handful of hopeful enthusiasts, including a 17-year-old Don Marshall. I don't think any of us expected us to 
to grow to the extent that it has over the last few years. In the old days, uh, going back to 1958, when we commenced to rebuild the railway, we were uh, doctors and lawyers, clerks, people who had never held a hammer in their lives. And I don't think any of us realised just uh, what was in front of us when we started. We uh, probably all imbued with the same sense of not wanting to see something go, and I think we just didn't want the bureaucrats to remove part of our living history. Not only did the Puffing Billy Steam Preservation Society thwart the bureaucrats and preserve a unique heritage, eight years ago they severed their ties with the Victorian Government Railways altogether. Now Puffing Billy, with its volunteer force, is one of those rarities amongst railways. It makes a profit. Puffing Billy may be the last of a line on the rails around Australia, but you can't help feeling that it and its hundred-year-old technology will be around a long time after the Golflander, the Australand and a lot of today's trains have been forgotten.